Uh, hey everyone, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, March 11th, 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and we have got a bunch of cool stories and a special guest for you this week. We will be talking about uh, drilling into the Chicxulub Crater, the dinosaur killing Chicxulub Crater, uh, the Blue Origins uh, plans. Uh, if Dave Dickinson joins us, we will talk about the eclipse. If he does not, we will not. Um, except that it happened. New planets around old stars and an update on what's happening with the InSight mission. Uh, and joining us this week, we've got Sandy Springman. Hey, Sandy. Howdy, Fraser. we got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Happy Friday. Yay. we got Paul Sutter. Hey, how's it going? Good. And our special guest. Yay, this is really cool. I'm so excited. So we've got Sarah Milkovich. Welcome, Hello. Sarah. Hi, From everyone. NASA to talk about spaceships. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. So, Sarah, can you give everyone an intro, who you are, what you do, and then we'll get into the, into the nitty-gritty on it. Sure. So uh, I am both a planetary geologist and what's called a science systems engineer here at NASA JPL. Uh, science system engineer is like the name implies. It's it's where science and engineering come together. So every spacecraft has a science team and an engineering team. The science team wants to collect awesome data and ask really big questions. And the engineering team wants to keep the spacecraft happy and healthy and just going. And these two things don't always work well together. Uh, so my job is to be a bridge between those two teams and be sort of a scientist embedded in the engineering team to translate between the groups and advocate for good science as much as possible while explaining the realities of engineering to the scientists. So if you were on this enterprise, you would be like half Spock, half, half Scotty. Yeah, kind of. Sort of in the... I like to go with the Gen Z Dax uh, metaphor because she's got the scientific inquiry, but she's always in there trying to figure out how are you going to do something and helping O'Brien. But I'm a big DS9 fan, so... I, me too. I, it's the best show. So <laughs> I should have I should have gone with Jadzia Dex. She was like a surgeon, but also yeah, absolutely. Um, so okay, so so that, I mean that's a very kind of interesting role. So I mean, what was your training to get you into? Did you start on the science path, or did you start on the engineering path and make your way into the other path of it? I started with science, so. I, I mean, really where it started, the interest in going into this was back even back in high school, and uh, I, I did an internship for a camp, one of the camera teams on a spacecraft called Near-Earth Asteroid Rendezvous, and just getting that window into what's the behind the scenes of everything that has to happen in order for you to get these fantastic pictures from outer space. Um, so that was really a, a key experience for me. Um, I went, I, my background, my educational background is entirely science. So I do have a PhD in planetary geology. And, uh, but I always knew that what I wanted out of that was to go into spacecraft operations, to be part of the team of people who collect the science data. So, um, I came to JPL uh, as a postdoc doing follow-up research after I got my degree. But then I was hired on in this more operations, science planning, science system engineering area. And I've worked um, science operations on a number of missions, uh, Mars Phoenix, Cassini, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and Curiosity. And now I work for Mars 2020, where I'm more behind the scenes and thinking about how are we going to operate it. Um, but I've had to pick up the engineering as I go along. Um, there's there's little sort of day-long classes here and there that I've taken, but I don't have a formal degree in engineering at all. Right. Got to calculate your statics and your dynamics. Um, <laughs> so, well, so I'm a system engineer, which is like... This form of engineering where you think about how do 
or the interfaces between your systems. And some people come to this from a very rigorous, like, they're a mechanical engineer, and they think about how this thing's going to bolt onto the spacecraft and that kind of thing. And I'm more of a, how are these groups going to exchange information, and how are they going to talk to each other? And so it's, it's, it's a different form of engineering. There's not a lot of training in it. It's a lot of it's on the job. Right. Well, so, I mean, my degree is in computer science, and so I, you know, I am a software engineer. Um, so, you know, sort of that same thing. Um, but, uh, so you, you mentioned briefly the Mars 2020 rover, which I think is one of the most interesting ones. So for people who aren't aware of what the 2020 rover is going to be, can you give people an intro on that mission? Yes. Uh, so 2020 is the next ro the next rover that NASA is sending um, to Mars. And what we're doing is it's taking the same as much of the same hardware as we had as we developed for Curiosity and rebuilding it. But we have a whole new set of science objectives, and so we're making changes to the rover where we have new science instruments, our whole theme is understanding the possibilities for life on Mars. And there's two fundamental aspects of that. One of them is to understand uh, Mars as a uh, ancient Mars, ancient microbial life on Mars. We're going to go look we're, we're going to go look for the signs of past life on Mars, and we're talking about billions of years, and we're talking old, and we're talking about microbes. We're not talking about dinosaurs or anything like that. Um, and, the, and then there's another aspect, which is prepping for f potential human exploration of Mars. So we have this set of science instruments that are all focused on understanding an area of Mars, its geology, its habitability, which is a lot of the same questions that Curiosity has been asking. But then uh, looking for what we call biosignatures, which are very subtle signs in the rock that life had to have once been present there. We are also going to be, instead of drilling powders, powder and, uh, from the rocks and putting it into science equipment that science instruments that we bring with we're actually going to be placing cores in tubes and placing those tubes on the surface of Mars um, we hope that someday there's we, we don't it's not approved it's not funded but the the hope is that someday another spacecraft might come along and pick these samples up and bring them back to earth uh, so that we can really investigate them in detail uh, in in all the kinds of laboratory equipment that is impossible to miniaturize and launch and send to Mars. Um, there's a lot of really great experiments you can do with with uh, that require things like particle accelerators, and you can't shrink that down and launch it and send that send that out to Mars. So that's one very complicated, very exciting aspect of 2020. And the other another aspect is that. We are bringing along um, a weather instrument to understand the weather that, that astronauts might be exposed to and have to live in, but also um, we have what's called in-situ resource utilization. What that means is that we want to learn how to use the stuff that's already there on Mars to support humans on Mars. So for example, you don't want to have to bring along thousands of kilograms of oxygen, not for the astronauts to breathe, but to launch them off the surface and get them back home to Earth. We want to try and figure out, can we use the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and split it out and, and form oxygen from that? So you saw some of this kind of equipment in the Martian, if you went and saw the Martian. Um, what we're doing is we're sending an instrument called MOXIE, which is a, basically a small test version, and we're going to strap that onto the rover. and Really, what we're trying to get at is how does this how does this box behave on Mars? Does it behave how we expect, or is there something else going on that we're not aware of that means that we have to change the technology in some way? So that's a very broad right. brush across a lot yeah. of things that we're trying to do with this rover. But I think one, I mean, there's two really exciting aspects of this for me. One is that we are we are now you know, with the 2020 rover, 
uh, and I guess whatever it's going to end up getting its final name, um, it is the point where you can finally say, yes, we're looking for life. Like up until this point, we've been looking for evidence that there was water in the ancient past, and then we're looking for evidence with curiosity that there has been water acting on Mars for long periods of time. But that question of whether or not there is there was life in the past or is life now has been punted kind of down the road in order to capture really good scientific evidence about the presence of water over long periods of time. And we saw what happened with the Viking lander back yeah. in the 70s where, you know, there, there wasn't enough good experiments to be able to definitively say, yes, indeed, you know, we fed a bunch of Martian soil stuff and the little bacteria is went crazy there. But now the right instruments and the right technology is being sent to, to get a proper answer. At least, you know, it can't confirm the negative, right? It can't prove the negative, but at least if it does find some kind of evidence, it's it's you know, then you can say, yes, you know, bacteria made bacterial colonies made that. So I think that's great and, and super exciting. And obviously, you know, if discovered is what? Like one of the most important discoveries in the history of scientific inquiry on Earth, right? It, like, it's, Yeah, it has the potential to be. And one thing that is also interesting if we don't find any evidence, so we think from... So, so when we sent Viking, we didn't understand Mars well enough to ask the question well. And that is really exemplified by the fact that later Phoenix went and discovered perchlorate, this, this salt in the soil on Mars, and Curiosity has found it too. And the presence of perchlorate in the soil um, helps explain this kind of murky, confusing stuff that we saw happen with the Viking experiments. We didn't know enough about Mars to define our experiment very as, as well as we could have. Um, and it's just it's, it shows how hard the question of is there life on another planet really is. And so all of the last dec several decades of Mars exploration has been breaking that down into questions. So first you want to look for water and understand the history of water on Mars. And as we were doing that, we learned so much. And so now we think that early Mars was very different from Mars today and that the most likely plate the most likely time period to look for life on Mars is ancient Mars, this very early Mars. Um, and then we could say, okay, water's not enough. It has there's a lot of other conditions you have to have in order to support life, and that's habitability, and that's where curiosity comes in. And so we've really had to build on this series of of um, more simpler, still complicated, but more simple, but but simpler questions, that, um, in order to get to the point where we can finally ask the question: Was there ever life on Mars? One one interesting thing, though, is that uh, because now everything we know about Mars, we think early Mars and early Earth were more similar to each other than Mars and Earth today. So, if uh, we understand how life evolved on the Earth, nothing has, there's nothing that's telling us that it can't have also evolved on Mars. If we don't find any evidence for life, ancient life on Mars, then that might be able to, inf to inform us on how did life evolve on the Earth. Yeah. So it's, it's not just that if we, you know, we go and we don't find anything, oh shoot, you know, oh well, it's a, that's an interesting result as well. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, famously said that either the universe is, you know, there's life in the universe or there isn't, and either thought is sort of very interesting. That's me paraphrasing, you know, much more sort of disturbing quote. Um, so I mentioned two things that I found super interesting about this mission. That, of course, is the, is the, is the first one. They were finally, the, the, it, you know, the most important question human beings can ask, which is, are we alone in the universe? Um, the, the second thing I think that I really like is that it's using the same platform as Curiosity for the large part. So all those lessons that were learned in building a rover the upsides and the downsides, like, you know, maybe upgrade the wheel 
yes. toughness, you know, um, is, on that. Yes, we're gonna yeah, you know, is that, you know, I would love to see an army of these things, right? Mass produced, coming out of a Ford factory somewhere, and then, and then, you know, with the plutonium uh, reactor put in and, and uh, fired off to, to, to Mars and across the whole, the whole solar system. So, is working with a established platform, has that really been helpful from, a, from an engineering standpoint? I think it's been helpful and difficult simultaneously. Uh, it's helpful in that, you know, yeah, we know how to build these things. We know uh, where the pitfalls are. There are difficulties in that we are trying to, we do have new instruments, we have new things we need to do, so there's an aspect of we have to figure out how to kind of retrofit some things in. Um, so keeping track of what you can just rebuild, what you can just go find a flight spare from Curiosity and use that one instead, um, that has helped the engineering side of the team really uh, move very quickly through certain parts of the development process, but it's made a lot of challenges elsewhere trying to, trying to figure out, we have instruments that we're, new instruments, we're trying to figure out how do you fit them into the boxes where the Curiosity instruments were. So that's been a challenge. Um, the, uh, in terms of where my role sits especially, which is thinking about how we're going to operate it, um, it's been useful that we can, we can watch the Curiosity operations team and say, okay, what do we need to do the same and what do we need to do different? In, because of the different objectives of this mission. And so I like to, to joke around with some of the, the, the folks on the Curiosity team that I'm very glad that they have this test rover running around on the surface that we can learn from. Um, but so there's got to be that conversation, <laughs> right, among the engineers. Like, what did we learn, right? If we, could, yeah. if we could do it all over again, what would we tweak and fix? But let's not try and reinvent the wheel. I think it's just, you know, it would be great if we could get more missions using fairly established platforms to more places around the solar system, more places that we could look at. I, you know, I, I think it's just a really great direction. I think uh, there's, the thing is, is that, so more places around Mars, certainly, more places around the solar system, that gets tricky because so much, you know, this has a particular a uh, thermal regime that it works in, it has a, you know, the whole system is very much designed for Mars, and so if you're going to send it to somewhere else, at that point, you can't necessarily, I think you wouldn't necessarily want to start with the same platform, you'd start with what have we learned, what are our lessons learned, but you still need to, you know, if you're, you're going to an icy satellite out there somewhere, you got to start with what are the what are the conditions that if you're sending it to the moon I mean if you're sending it to somewhere like Venus then all bets are off uh, so so there's definitely uh, modules perhaps that you could pull out and that you could use as your for your assembly line idea but it, for like the whole rover itself it's really it's really developed for Mars and I, I think it would be a big challenge to just kind of tweak it over and be like, oh, I'm going to dial a few things differently and then I can send it uh, to, to this other planetary body. Um, so let's say that you do find the Holy Grail, right? You do find life, evidence of past life on Mars. The big question then is going to be, is that life still connected, still share a common ancestor with life on Earth through, you know, panspermia, some kind of transmission of life back and forth between the, the planets? Will you have any way to be able to get to the bottom of that answer? So what we're doing with 2020 on the surface of Mars is identifying potential biosignatures. These are, we're going to be able to say this potentially, this has a high likelihood of being formed by a biological process. Uh, but to say definitively this absolutely had to have been formed by a biological process can't be done by the rover. It has to be done by all of these much fancier experiments that you can do on the Earth. And so 
I don't want to sort of oversell what we're going to be able to do with 2020. The, because uh, it's, it's that situation where extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Uh, so the definitive, we have, you know, if we say we have found evidence of ancient life on Mars, that is, is something that you need a lot of simultaneous lines of evidence pointing in the same direction. Um, we are, you know, going to give it our best shot I, with the with the instruments that we have on the rover, we're working at unprecedented microscopic scales. We're sending new kinds of instruments to look for, um, to map organics and hydrated minerals and uh, elemental chemistry on on microscopic scales. Basically, uh, the spot size for our instruments are some of them are less than a hundred microns. Um, but there's a lot of challenges about operating on Mars. So uh, I just, you know, I don't. I, I will I will be extremely surprised if at the end of 2020's prime mission we'll be able to say you know yes we've found life um, and we don't we certainly don't have any instrumentation on the rover to do anything like a DNA analysis or something like that um, that is all the kind of thing that you need a very sophisticated laboratory to do and with a lot of um, you know, I'm making the, all the, the, the control standards and all of that kind of thing. So um, it's a much longer term uh, thought about sort of what comes next after, uh, after the results are in and analyzed. That's a hard question for me to answer, honestly. Uh, and of course, if you do find, you know, evidence or, or you do suspect that there's life, then the whole kind of cross planetary contamination becomes a question, right? You, you know, you don't want to contaminate the the samples with Earth life, and you don't necessarily want to contaminate Earth with Mars life. Although they, you know, they they did form in fairly different environments, but you know, either way, you're kind of wrecking your science, potentially wrecking the biosphere of the of the other world. So we we are. Um Planetary protection is what we call it, and that we we have uh, we're, we're working on uh, how are we going to make sure that the spacecraft is clean? How are we going to make sure that the sample tubes are clean? What level of cleanliness does everything have to be up to? And how are we going to get it there and keep it there through the whole build, test, and launch process? Um, the yeah. So right now. We are in this stage of mission development um, where we have we've we've got we're working on our designs and we're running different kinds of tests. We haven't yet actually built the rover, so this is the time period where we're thinking, okay, what are our requirements? That's what what uh, we all call them. It's it's very carefully we carefully writing down exactly what we need to be done. And then, uh, and and so there's a lot of there's people at headquarters who um, who think about planetary protection. There's people on the 2020 mission who think about planetary protection. Um, and so we're all, you know, yes, both the making sure that if we we get excited and we say, oh, we found E. coli on Mars, that it's not E. coli we brought with us. Um, and, and also thinking there's, there's people who are thinking about um, if we were to bring samples back to Earth, uh, which is a future, you know, that's not us, that's a future mission, um, what would, what's involved from a planetary protection standpoint in terms of, um, you know, the, protecting the Earth, protecting this, yeah, the scientific viability of the samples and also uh, interactions with the Earth. One of the great uses for the International Space Station, I think, is a nice, safe place to be able to take samples and, and examine them away from the, the Earth's biosphere. So, you know, that, there's my vote. <laughs> so I want to throw some, uh, some questions at you from, uh, from some of the viewers. Um, Tom Nathie asks, any plans for planet-wide seismometry for Mars and other objects? So is there any, you know, you're a planetary geologist, any seismology plans with the with the rover? Uh, not with 2020. Uh, seismology on Mars is again one of those things that we've wanted to do for a very long time. Uh, there was a mission 
a number of years ago now called Netlander, which was going to go put out, I think, three or four seismic stations and monitor. Um, the only spacecraft that I'm aware of that has a seismometer component to it is InSight, which, uh, as everyone here probably knows, was suspended, but um, it missed the launch window uh, due to some issues that they had with the construction. And, um, but they have just put together a plan to, to sort of unsuspend and race to the next launch window. So that's the... No that's spoilers. That's, we're going to be talking about that later oh, on in the, in the show. <laughs> but now, now it's ruined. Later. <laughs> well, it was a good question. Everybody. Yeah, no, no, that's great. That's great news. Um, also, another question is, um, what about a microphone? Um, we are talking about the possibility of a microphone on 2020. I don't recall. I don't know what the status of it is. We uh, want to know what it sounds like to hear yeah, the wind there's, blowing. On there's the a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of. Interest in, a, in in listening to different things. There's there's um, some some people think it would be great to listen to the drill as you drill. Um, uh, listen to we have we're going to have super cam, which is sort of the next generation chem cam. So it's uh, we we just like Curiosity except more lasers. And so it's like, can you listen to the laser firing and the spark off of the rock? And what would that sound like? Um, so there's a lot of ideas out there. Uh, you know, every time we want to add something to the rover that is mass, that is cost, that is schedule, that is, you know, do we have the people to work on it and what are we trading off? Because we do ultimately, we can only land a certain amount of mass on the surface of Mars and if we, if we're adding, you know, and, and, um, we want to make sure that we're supporting all of the things that we absolutely need. So there's, you know, people have a long sort of wish list of things they'd like to add, um, and microphone is definitely one of them. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, just hearing what the drill sounds like, hearing the terrain as the rover is going across the rocks or the sand or, or you know, the, um, you know, the salty brine, you know, being able to even hear the wind blowing through or hearing just the environment around, like it's a whole other sense. I would be, I think it would be really interesting. So, again, yeah. I know my vote is huge there. Uh, I'm just, just mark me down for we would really like uh, a microphone. Um, uh, Thomas Tranecker asks, could we get a speaker to play David Bowie's Life on Mars? Is that possible? <laughs> I don't think we're going to have a speaker. Um, the oh, speaker wow. is like lower, much, much lower priority than a microphone. I think uh, on Curiosity, one of the instruments, Sam, uh, it sort of has these vibrator things. It has, there's somehow in it, they've gotten it to play music. So it's, uh, it's played happy birthday to itself. Um, but, but no, we're not gonna we're not gonna send up life on Mars and, and play it. Maybe we'll play that in the cut in uh, the operations facility. You could probably that. play it with one of the drills, maybe just by changing <laughs> the speed on the drill. Um, so uh, one last question, and this comes from Sylvan Westby, uh, which is, uh, what do you think about test growing vegetables in Moon Mars and Earth like soil? Uh, how right do you think the the Martian got? Are we gonna have potatoes on Mars? Um, I, uh, I don't really know how to answer that. Um, I, I don't know, that's, I don't know about what is in the soil and what are the nutrients needed to grow potatoes or vegetables or whatever in the soil. Um, my actual scientific background is is more on the rocks and the the polar deposits. I'm a, I'm more on the the, the ice. It's, it's more what I do my research on. Um, and I'm very interested in what did Mars used to be like and how has Mars changed to get to be where it is today and how might it change in the in the future. Um, and so I'm one of the people who I'm like, yeah, I don't like the terraforming or whatever, it's 
like go have fun. It's not my it's not my thing. I like the rocks. I like the robots. Other people like the pe- the idea of people there. I I'm gonna go hang out with the robots looking at the rocks. So then perhaps a question about uh, a Martian margarita might be more <laughs> appropriate. Yeah. Or perhaps could we make building materials out of the out of the rocks? But I mean, the, I guess the thing is, is that I mean, you know, it's for you, it's the science, right? Yes. Yeah. I I uh, I'm interested in the science. I'm interested in the the science story of Mars. Where has Mars been, and where is Mars going? Um, and there are a lot of people who are interested in the human story of Mars and how could Mars be potentially useful for humans. Um, 2020 is, I think, one of the first missions where these two groups are coming together. They did a little bit with Curiosity with the radiation detector instrument, RAD. But um, 2020 is really bringing these two groups together in a in a new way and so uh, so that's one thing that's fun for me I've worked on a number of different missions and I learn new things each time I learn new science each time I'm not an astrobiologist by profession or by training so I'm learning it all on the job and so that's been great fun and um, as we get more involved with the human spaceflight side of things I will I will start to learn more so maybe in a couple of years I will actually have an answer about vegetables but I don't have <laughs> right. <laughs> well um, yeah I think it would be great a little a little potato growing facility on the the rover would be, would be <laughs> um, well I you know you've got uh, a busy schedule today, so we're going to have to let you go, but uh, can you let people know both sort of where to find out more about you and the project you're working on and also the the rover? Yeah, um, so the we do have a website for 2020. It is um, at Mar- so we're under mars.nasa.gov slash m2020. Um, because we don't yet have our shiny rover name, we don't have you know like curiosity or spirit or opportunity, um, uh, and I believe that we will have an essay contest. So, so sharpen your pencils, think of great ideas, or, or feed great ideas to to your neighborhood children to write an essay for you. Um, so you can find out much more about the mission. Follow along with us there, um, and then you can also. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think I put my Twitter handle under here, but it's M I L K Y S A Milky Saw. So you can you can follow along with me there. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, pass along our uh, wishes to the uh, to the rest of the team, both the scientists and the engineers. Um, and uh, I can't wait to hear what what happens next. So when you do have a name, maybe come back and and let us know what it is. I will do so. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so I just want to uh, remind everyone that this is a uh, live show. Uh, a big thanks to the whole Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the dedicated fans who kind of keep the show produced. They they book the guest. They sort of talk about some of the stories we're going to be talking about. It's uh, it's awesome. And so you can just do a search for WSH Crew. And, uh, you know, they've got now a website, they've got Google Plus Forum, uh, all kinds of good places, and join that community and really participate in helping make the show that you want to see. Special thanks to Nancy Graziano, as always, for helping uh, book our guest. And um, I want to give a big thanks to... um, to Susie Murph, who is the producer for the show. Uh, she has been a longtime producer on for the Weekly Space Hangout, as well as Astronomy Cast, and now has kind of shifted her role over to working more with CosmoQuest. So she's taking all of those production jobs and 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 pitching in over on CosmoQuest because Pamela, you know, needs a lot of help. I don't know if you heard the news, uh, but you know. CosmoQuest got an $11.5 million grant to uh, for the science. So, so uh, thanks. Susie is going to continue being the producer for this show, but now she's going to be producing a whole bunch of other stuff with CosmoQuest. So I just wanted to thank her so much for all of her work so far, and uh, and everything's going to be exactly the same. So um, let's move on to all of the cool uh, news stories this week. So uh, ooh, what do I want to talk about? Um, I'm going to start with, uh, I want to talk about uh, human spaceflight. So, uh, Morgan, can we talk about Blue Origin? 
we absolutely can talk about Blue Origin because for the last few years we haven't really been talking about them at all. And few people know that Blue Origin as a company actually started uh, 16 years ago in the year 2000. And so they've been working for a long time to get to the point uh, where they are today. And that makes it perhaps a little bit less surprising when they announced uh, this week in an interview with some reporters that they hoped to begin sending tourists above this international line of space in 2018. Now, for those of you without calendars at home, that's pretty dang soon. And in fact, it might even be sooner than uh, Virgin Galactic, the company we've been tracking for the last several years, uh, which also just wants to put um, space tourists up above the international line for space uh, within the next few years. Uh, but Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic are taking two very different tactics to accomplish the same basic thing. You might recall Virgin Galactic has this sort of two-part system where they strap a rocket plane to a regular airplane, they fly that guy up uh, pretty high, they drop the rocket plane, they blast it off, and that takes you up to space and then you glide back down um, to Earth. On the other hand, Blue Origin is building their system much more like a traditional rocket. Uh, and in fact, they've called their system New Shepard, uh, after Alan Shepard, the first American in space, because the trip that tourists will have will mirror very closely the trip that Alan Shepard took um, all those decades ago, because you'll blast off of a vertical rocket uh, as one of six tourists inside of a capsule that is sort of similar in size to like an Apollo-style capsule. Uh, you'll peak just above 100 kilometers, which is the international line for space, spend several minutes floating around in weightlessness before descending back down to the Earth. You won't go into orbit, uh, and you'll land with a parachute and thump back down into the ground. It, it won't land back on its own launch pad like the tests they've been doing? So the rocket will. I'm not sure what they've said about the capsule yet. Oh, that so makes sense. Okay, yeah, rocket, yeah, yeah. Well, and so SpaceX with their Dragon capsule has demonstrated the ability to soft land their, their capsule um, onto the ground, but with unlike the, the rocket, they're not going to have lots of fuel to maneuver a long distance back. Uh, so... One of the things that Blue Origin is emphasizing is that the only way to become good at space is by doing it a lot. And that there's no company in space today that launches more than, say, a dozen times a year. And they say no one can get good at doing anything a dozen times a year. And they say they intend to build a fleet of these New Shepard uh, systems and launch them many dozens of times every year. And with that, they'll be able to develop a routine for launching, landing, recovering, and transporting um, the various parts of the system all back to the same place. Um, they haven't announced a price, but it's going to be pricey. Uh, Virgin Galactic uh, has been selling tickets for about a quarter million US dollars, and it's difficult to imagine that this uh, New Shepard system will be cheaper than that. Uh, and so it's not something for you or I uh, at this point. But like all of these other sort of new generation space companies, uh, they have the goal of making this routine, and when things become routine, they become less expensive. And they hope to see the average person being able to take a space tourism trip to space just like you might go on vacation to anywhere else. Now, and this is sort of one path that they're taking, right? The other path is to go down the route that SpaceX is doing and try to actually get to an orbital level of energy too. Yeah, that's right. They're actually pursuing three paths uh, at the same time. The first is the space tourism path. The second is the SpaceX path, which is to build your own large launch vehicle capable of delivering satellites to orbit, launching NASA missions, things like that. And the third is they're actually developing and selling their own rocket engines. And so the next generation um, rocket from Boeing um, that will replace the Atlas V, the Delta IV, et cetera, is going to be built around Blue Origin engines uh, as, instead of the engines that are currently sourced uh, from companies in Russia. And so they see these three pretty independent lines of possibility as a way to not only ensure the stability of their company, but to give three different ways to have rapid growth. And it's going to take rapid growth to keep these companies um, moving forward so they can get those prices down and begin to get more and more people engaged in the process. Yeah, I think it's, you know, and we mentioned this last time that 
you know, that people sort of see this 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 great gulf between what SpaceX is doing and what and what Blue Origins is doing, but it's really just a, a it's a time frame. Jeff Bezos is as rich as Elon Musk, oh, richer, richer almost certainly, and and is as ferocious an entrepreneur as as Elon Musk. Again, maybe more so. And if there's like one person, and and I don't know if Jeff Bezos necessarily has the same uh, sort of humanitarian goals to you know send humans to Mars and and colonize the solar system. Like I think Bezos wants to get into this because he sees this as the future. So uh, you know, let's see where we're at two years from yeah, now. We're I seeing mean, two. Gonna be able, the gap will close. We're seeing two very different. Uh, PR strategies, more or less. There may not actually be a tremendous gap. Uh, Bezos said that he didn't avoid uh, talking about Blue Origin for more than a decade, really out of a sense of secrecy. Uh, it was much more out of a sense of not wanting to overpromise. And he said it's very easy to overpromise when you're talking about space, and he wanted to make sure that he could deliver on the things that his company promised. Uh, and that's very, I'd say, opposite in. Um, comparison to the way SpaceX has conducted itself in which they have continued to process or to promise uh, everything whether it's you know internet raining down from us from hundreds of satellites or colonies on the moon or colonies on Mars etc uh, and so far they have yet to fail to deliver but it's just a different way of of promoting yourself and I think you're right within the next few years we're going to see them accomplishing many of the very same uh, things just from two different directions. Yeah, yeah, and they're going to learn from each other's mistakes. So this is how they this is how they all operate. Um, cool. Well, I'm I'm excited. Uh, so show of hands here, who would who would fly on the Blue Origin rocket? Not the first one. But Not the first one. Maybe the the tenth one. Yeah, Sandy, you go on the first one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think I'd wait. I don't. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of of like roller coasters. I will, I will so that, like. I will go, you know, one way to Mars. I will do like petrology on Mars. Like really? I, will, okay. I will, I will, like you know, you put me on a rocket. I'm like, yeah, you're you're an admitted adventurer. Um, well, yeah. I, you know, yeah, whatever, just sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and everyone in the people in the chat sure would. Um, uh, okay, cool. Well, let's move on. So, uh, Paul, why don't we talk about new planets around old stars? Yeah, check this out. Some astronomers at the uh, Very Large Telescope Interferometer, uh, which is a European instrument uh, based in the mountains of Chile, uh, they looked at this old system and they found some striking resemblances to things we're very familiar with. Uh, so this particular system is very, very old. It's actually a binary system where one of the stars uh, was more massive and actually uh, uh, blew off its outer layers. And the other star is continuing to accrete, and they're you know having a little dance in the middle. But all the material that was blown off in the star, uh, kind of mixed with the leftover remnants of that system. And now, when we look at it in the infrared, we see what looks a lot like a protoplanetary disk or a disk of gas and dust that's still forming uh, or about to become a solar system. But it's not at the beginning of a star's life. This is actually at the end of a star's life. And we see a ring. Uh, we actually see an inner edge of the ring, which is very common in protoplanetary systems. Uh, so it raises the question of, can a second round of planet formation happen at the end of a star's life uh, and not just at the beginning? Mm -hmm. So what is the mechanism then? Well, you've got a bunch of stuff uh, blown out, so you have uh, maybe some remaining dust uh, kind of scattered around the system, and then you're beefing it up with more material that's been uh, sloughed off the surface of the star, and maybe that's enough to set up some gravitational instabilities, get some sticky molecules sticking together, uh, and then maybe in this disk that just more and uh, more planets can be formed. Uh, so are we going to have something like that in the far future of the own sun, or is this like, you know, a different kind of star system? I mean, this kind of star system is a binary system. I don't think 
that's important for uh, this proposed mechanism of making a next generation of, of planets in the same system. It could be, though, I mean, this is just the first time we've seen something like this, and it just happens to be a binary star system. We don't know how generic or common this scenario is. So I wonder, though, I mean, you know, we, we always wonder about life, right? We always think, like, you know, if... I stay up at night, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with these weird systems, right? Like, if you had a place that got started much later on in the evolution of its star, you know, would it be a hospitable environment, or would it just be too cold and suck? Yeah, in the uh, second round, after a star uh, turns into a red giant uh, and then uh, loses its outer layers, there is a period where the star is pretty quiet and tame. Uh, this is when it's burning helium, fusing helium in its core. And that is like the right mixture of the conditions you need for life because you can have a habitable zone. Uh, you don't have massive solar flares or massive dumps of radiation. If you have a planet there that could support liquid water, you could have life on there except this helium burning phase doesn't last for billions of years like the hydrogen burning phase. It only lasts for like a few million years, maybe up to a hundred million years. Which, so even if life got started, there's not a lot of time for it to evolve uh, to build rocket ships to get get the heck out of there. Yeah, so, um, but then maybe if you can make it to that white dwarf phase, then, then you've got a pretty stable environment that's slowly cooling down for the trillions of years, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, white dwarfs and red dwarfs last, uh, you know, give off heat for uh, billions and trillions of years. Uh, there, the, the problem is the habitable zone is very, very close to the star. Uh, that's where you have the right temperatures where you can have liquid water. There is st still some variability uh, in the amount of radiation put out by red dwarfs and white dwarfs. And so if you're right up next to the star where you can have liquid water, you might wake up to, uh, you know, a lot of cancer someday. Right. Space cancer. Space cancer. All right. Uh, let's move on, Sonny. Let's talk about... Now, we, we had it spoiled for us, but uh, why don't we just like try and pretend like we didn't learn what happened with Insight and, and take another crack at it? Well, um, we learned a couple of days ago that Insight will most likely be going to Mars in 2018, so May of 2018. It was supposed to launch around this time, and Morgan and I were going to do a road trip. We were going to go in uh, Jane Houston Jones and... Uh, <laughs> Morris Jones's uh, launch van. I love it when a van comes together, and we were going to drive up to Vandenberg, and we were going to watch this launch. We were going to watch the first planetary mission launch from Vandenberg to alleviate launch congestion on the eastern seaboard, and it was going to be great, but no go. And part of the reason, well, the reason they are not launching this month to go to Mars is because the seismometer is not working. And so if you are sending a geophysics mission to Mars, to m try to measure Mars quakes and your seismometer doesn't work, then you should not go to Mars. But the fact that they found this out about three months before they were supposed to launch for Mars is sort of problematic. And the fact that the main instrument on this mission didn't work was problematic. So now they have 26 months to fix the mission, and they're probably going to get about $150 million to fix the mission and just keep paying everyone for the next 26 months until they can launch again. So this is, this is good news if you're a Martian. This is good news if you're working on InSight. This is good news if you're working on Marco, which were the two CubeSats that we're going to launch with InSight to provide relay for entry, descent, and landing communications for InSight so we could find out if it landed or not. This is These are important basic things. Um, for other members of the planetary science community, especially um, the uh, the people who are proposing missions, this is not so good news. And the reason it's not good news is that we just had a call for discovery mission proposals in the fall. And so InSight is a discovery mission proposal, and it was one of three that was selected. And so now we've got five finalists for discovery missions that will get selected this time around, and we, um, we were sort of expecting that two might get selected depending on budget and depending on some other things, but now that there's going to be $150 million that has to come out of the Discovery Mission budget somehow to go pay for InSight to be maintained, it might be that we don't get two Discovery Missions this time around, because it was pretty likely that we were going to have an asteroid mission 
and then a Venus mission this time. So it looks like we will get either an asteroid mission or a Venus mission um, because there have been because of this insight issue. And this is actually really unfortunate um, that they couldn't have this seismometer work. And part of what's going on with the seismometer is to get um, to do size to do geophysics properly on Mars and to measure Mars quakes, you need a network of landers on Mars measuring vibrations on Mars. Um, but they're like, we can do this with one sensor. We can build this really great seismometer that is super sensitive, and we'll put it in this vacuum. So not even molecular vibrations. It won't even have molecular vibrations on the, it can't even detect its own vibrations on the instrument. Unfortunately, the seismometer has a leak. So that the vacuum that they were they built it just can't hold out an atmos Mars's atmosphere. So it would leak in. And so the seismometer wouldn't work. So this is really bad. <laughs> The, it's not exactly, I mean, it is rocket science to build yeah. a seismometer vacuum seal and send it to Mars and have it work. And it's good that we found out this out before it got to Mars. And like, oops, sorry, it didn't work, y'all. How many millions of dollars bust? Sorry. So yeah. I'm really glad we figured this out soon. But it's also just sort of unfortunate that it's going to, going to affect other missions, other potential missions. It, well, it's, it's rough, right? I mean, the, that launch window, as you said, to Mars is so short you know, and you really you've got to get that done. You only have that once every twenty six months to send yeah. that to send that mission along. And so, if there's any kind of problem with the project, and you miss that window, you know, buckle up. You got another two years to get it fixed, I guess. But all those all those all those other projects have got to respond to that situation. So it's not just like James Webb. You know, they can push it a week, another week, another month. Yeah, Eventually, it doesn't, really yeah, it doesn't matter, and it's the way it's going to go. Uh, I guess with Venus, you've got more launch windows, right? I think, I mean, oh. Venus, um, some of the, one of the asteroid missions, though, it's a uh, Trojan tour, and so if they miss their launch window, they miss their launch window, and you can't launch Lucy. Ever. So, it ha yeah, it, you know, you'd have to wait for a while. So. A, week, a, few, a few thousand years, yeah. So it's... Yeah. It would be, you know, it's it's just sort of unfortunate that, you know, a problem that didn't get, you know, a problem like this is sort of not only going to affect Insight, at least Insight will get to launch, but it'll also affect other potential missions. So yeah, there might be do. some some non-Mars people in the planetary science community who are a little who are who are sort of saddened about this and how it's affecting things. But I think this is really good news for the Mars community. It's really good news for the geophysics community. And it's just great news if you want to have a seismometer on another planet to start figuring out what the interior of Mars is like. This will be the first time we've been able to do this. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the big unknown questions about Mars is, is Mars still geologically active? I mean, you look at things like those gigantic, uh, you know, Olympus Mons and those other uh, shield volcanoes on Mars, and so it clearly was volcanically active in the past. And some theories say that, you know, Olympus Mons could have could have erupted as recently as just a few million years ago. That it could happen again. And then the other theory is that it's been long dead. The whole place is frozen solid, and you know, there is no more activity. It's too yeah. bad. So, but it will be really cool to see what they find, and you know sort of the geologic history of Mars, what they can reveal, you know, maybe they'll be finding lots of meteorite impacts on Mars and what sort of Mars quakes there are and really what that can tell us about the interior of Mars and maybe future missions will land other seismometers elsewhere on Mars and we could really have a Martian seismometer network which would be really cool because then you could pinpoint where the Mars quakes are originating from, where inside the planet, how deep and that can tell you a lot. Well, uh, let's hope they get this fixed for the, over the next uh, two years, and it doesn't cause too much uh, of an issue to the other missions. And uh, uh -huh. and that way, I would really love to be able to compress that. Right now, I do have to say this big, long, you know, planetary geologists aren't sure about how active Mars is. It could have been as you know more recent. It could have been a long time ago. More data needed, and we can really shorten that down. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. So once again, this is all about me. Um, let's move on. Uh, Morgan, let's talk about uh, drilling into a crater here on Earth. Yeah, we all know that 66 million years ago, a giant rock from space hit the Earth and caused death and destruction to most species on Earth, including uh, all of the dinosaurs. Uh, and we have 
good evidence that this is the case. Uh, we see a layer Except of... for the birds, Morgan. <laughs> Except for the birds. That's true. Well, th that's where the dinosaurs went. They're eating seeds off of my deck right now. Pterodactyl, a pterodactyl uh, feeder? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we see this layer of ash all over the Earth at the exact uh, same level. In fact, wherever you live, you probably can figure out where the closest exposed bit of what's now called the KPG boundary um, is. And we also is, can now tell, based on gravitational measurements of the Earth, where this crater hit. It hit sort of off the U Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and we know we can very closely correlate this event with death and destruction of everything but birds uh, and mammals and some other things uh, all over the earth. But one of the things we haven't really known very well is what happened to the life in the immediate vicinity of this impact. Uh, we haven't been able to study that very well because most of this crater is underwater and the rest of it is in some of the densest jungle uh, on Earth, and this has piled up a lot of material on top of what was you know, now a 66 million year old crater, and it's not the best environment for pre preserving fossils and all, all these complicating effects. Uh, and so a team announced this week that in April they plan to drill down uh, through all of this to reach um, the buried remnants of the crater below and basically take a core going down, and they want to look and see uh, basically what it looked like in the vicinity of this crater. Was there any life that hung on at all in the sort of years to many years, centuries after this impact, or was it an instantaneous destruction? Uh, and this is really going to help us understand the effect of these large impacts on life everywhere, um, because this is the largest... Um, impact that we that we have good evidence tying it to the fossil record. We see larger craters elsewhere uh, on Earth, but we don't see real strong ties to the fossil record there. And so this is going to help us connect uh, astronomy with geology, with biology, and get a picture of how these um, solar system objects really shaped the course of the evolution uh, and development of life on Earth. Very cool. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, I guess it's its not super surprising, as you said. It's, you know, underwater. It's in fairly thick jungle. But, it, but it's a really fascinating place to do this this planetary geology and try and, you know, but here on Earth. It's, it's got to be easier than doing the same thing on Mars, anyway. In a lot of ways, it's easier. In some ways, it's more difficult, because in Mars, you don't have uh, foliage uh, and dirt and stuff piled up on top of your uh, geologic processes. You know, It's a much simpler situation on Mars, even though it's still complicated, than it is here on Earth. And it's remarkable that this crater that killed most life on Earth, it's 100 kilometers across, was first spotted uh, from orbit, not from the ground. And that's because on the small scale, there's so much stuff there uh, to mess up your understanding. Very cool. Uh, well, we're reaching the end of our, our hour, so why don't we start to, to wrap things up. Um, one question, actually, I don't know if, if you can answer this one. This comes from Nancy Graziano. Has anyone visited or examined the portion of the crater that's submerged? How much of it actually remains after 66 million years of, of water erosion? It was... You know, it wasn't super easy to find in the first place. Right. So I don't think it's like if you took a sub down there, you'd just see this half of a bowl. What we basically see today uh, is sort of the compressed density around the rim of this crater, where this you know, big rock came in and smacked uh, the earth, and it compressed all of the soil and rocks and sediments and stuff into an extra dense area. And we can see this in a perfect circle, basically. Uh, and that's our evidence that we see it. I don't think if you went to the seafloor today, you would be able to see any direct evidence of it. And that's why they're having to drill down. Right. Very cool. Okay, so why don't we wrap things up? Uh, let's give people a chance to find out more. Uh, Sandy, at Sandy, where do people find out more? You can find more of me on Twitter. I'm at Sandy. Um, I haven't updated my blog in a while, but maybe, maybe I will. And There's what lots of fun on Twitter. There's to, lots of photos of Pluto. What if a person wanted to sort of stay up to date on, on the mission that you work with? Uh, what mission? Okay. <laughs> Morgan, where do you find out more? 
Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg. You can check out my website, morganrenberg.com. And I've been trying to give my YouTube page a facelift as well. I'm not sure if there's a fancy quick link to that, but if you Google uh, Morgan Renberg YouTube, I think you'll find some talks from me and from Kim Cartier uh, and some other people as well. Um, you guys shouldn't apologize. You're busy. It's all right. Um, Paul, Matt Sutter, where do people find out more? They can find out more at Paul Matt Sutter, as you so correctly identified me. Uh, that's both on Twitter and Facebook, and then my website, pmsutter.com, has all my activities. Uh, I also have a podcast uh, following in your brilliant leadership. Uh, I have a podcast, askaspaceman.com. You can also help support that podcast at patreon.com slash pmsutter. All it takes is a couple bucks, and I get to eat. Perfect. And we did a super fun crossover episode between the Guide to Space and Ask a Spaceman. And if you haven't Which seen that, up. that was amazing. Yeah, that was super fun. Yeah, so the question that I asked was is the. If you took the entire universe and like turned it into a black hole, would that make a whole new universe? Was the Big Bang just a black hole? And you answered that question, and then we looked into whether we're actually living inside of a black hole. Mm-hmm. So, uh, on on the on my feed, you can see the first part of that, and then on uh, on his feed, you can see the other half of it. It's great. Now, let's say that, that I wanted to get involved in some kind of Kickstarter. How uh, that you're going to be running? Can you give us sort of a, an update on that? Yeah, so I'll give a brief update. I'm actually going to be the guest on Weekly Space Hangout next week talking all about this project. I invited myself, and Nancy said it was fine. <laughs> it's got to be some kind of abuse of power here, some kind of corruption. I think, I think, I don't know, but she said it was cool, so, you know. You can see how much control we really have here. Yeah. Yes, very yeah, little. Just, I'll give a quick plug. So I, have the past 10 months, I've been working with a contemporary dance company here in Columbus, uh, to tell the life stories of the stars through dance, uh, you know, trying to bring science to people in new ways and connect with new audiences. Uh, the production is all set. The live premiere is April 21st, uh, but we want to create films of the production uh, to distribute around the world, and also we're making a 360 film for virtual reality headsets like the Oculus Rift, and then also for planetarium uh, distribution worldwide. And we need money to do that because professionals actually charge, uh, like, reasonable fees. So uh, we're launching a Kickstarter. It launches tomorrow, March 12th. Uh, For more information, you can go to songofthestars.org. Awesome. And then we'll talk about that more next week. I I have been informed. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, Really appreciate it. Thanks again to the WSH crew for... Uh, sort of really being the the fans and the producers of the show. If you want to get more involved, I highly recommend go check it out. WSH Crew, uh, and thanks to the guests. Thanks to Sarah for bringing the the NASA news. Really appreciate that. And uh, we will see all of you next week. Thank you, Fraser. <laughs>